It is my pleasure to introduce the first segment of today, Blue Horizons, Promise and Potential for the Future of Our Ocean, in which we will dive into scientific discoveries, ocean exploration, and technological innovations, moderated by Alejandro Alba, senior correspondent from Now This. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Leah, for the introduction. Um, as she said, my name is Alejandro Alba. I'm a senior correspondent at Now This, and I host a show at Now This Earth called Can It Save the Planet? And we've actually focused a lot of our episodes on the ocean. So we've done cloning corals, um, oyster reefs, and ocean wave energy. And it's one of those things that I think for a lot of people, the ocean's out of sight, out of mind, so they don't really think about it, but it's super important. So I want to thank Oceanic Global for hosting the summit and having me. Um, now, as Leah said, the session today is titled Blue Horizons, Promise and Potential for the Future of Our Ocean. And we're going to explore how scientific discovery, ocean exploration, and technological innovation all demonstrate how the ocean is our greatest ally in addressing the climate crisis. And we're going to see a few spotlights today. And they're all going to focus on regional marine biodiversity, voyages to the deep sea, entrepreneurship, youth empowerment, which is very important, especially at COP27 like this, and big ideas for the future of the ocean and discovery. Our first guest is Raquel Moses, and she is the Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. She's also a UN Global Ambassador in the Race to Zero. Today, she's going to be speaking about the need for collaborative innovation from her experience driving significant advancements on world-changing topics like climate change, sustainability, and building resilience. Raquel. Thank you so much for having me with you today. I really appreciate it, and I hope that I do this justice. Um, Joshua Sam Miller, that was brilliant start. Oh my gosh, you changed my life today. So thank you all so much for being here, and I'm gonna start with a story that um, isn't really ocean related, but hopefully it'll give you some context and tell you a little bit about our work, and then about a project that we're doing that, that I feel is really um, quite important. So, do you know what the big problem in 1894 was? Any hands? Any, any takers on what the big problem in 1894 was? No one wants to venture a guess? Horse manure. <laughs> I think Vladimir was about to guess. So, and, and the reason that horse manure was a problem was because we had horses all over the place. That was the main mode of transportation. And so, Horses were, you know, they, it's like 35 pounds of manure a day and several gallons of urine, and there were flies everywhere. People were getting sick. There was a big conference in New York. There was a big conference in London. What are we going to do? When the horses died, people would just leave them there, and then you'd have to get somebody, because you're not going to cart the horse away and cut it up. So somebody had to come and cut it up, but then there was a backlog. It was a mess. And at that time, they just didn't see how this was going to be solved. Fast forward to the car, and suddenly we have a whole new economy. And the horse manure disappeared. And I think for, for me, when I sort of started to read those articles, it was about, we need to innovate our way out of this, and we need to rethink entirely. The, you know, we need a complete systems change. So rather than trying to sort of fi fix bits and pieces here and there, we really need to just kind of take a step back and, and do a systems change. So at the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator, we represent 28 countries, and we do things like um, mangrove rehabilitation. We work with the, we work with the uh, governments on putting them together with private sector funding to, to fund mangrove rehabilitation. We do things like uh, fund entrepreneurs who do coral replanting as a tourism exercise, and um, we've done mangrove rehabilitation in Belize. But the project that I'm really excited about was something that was called Clean Up King started as Clean Up Kingston Harbor. And we were looking at how do we clean up the plastic waste in Kingston Harbor so that we would um, be able to let the mangroves thrive, have the, the fish, you know, the fish survive. And we discovered this company called CRDC, which we're now in partnership with. And they have turned plastic waste into a resin that can strengthen concrete. 
And so that helps us on two fronts. It helps us to improve our built environment. It improves the insulation of the concrete. But it also helps us to remediate all of that plastic waste. Because by the way, in the Caribbean, we have not one, not two, but three times per capita the plastic waste of the rest of the world because we have tourism as our main form of income. And so this project helps us to see real time that it is about looking at things differently and finding ways to innovate our ways out of the problems that we have. And you know, I was so inspired when I walked in here and I saw all of these young people because I know that you have, yes, brilliant solutions, brilliant solutions that can help us to solve the problems that we face. And we need to just, we need to, to invest in you and to support you and to encourage you and to tell you, listen, failure just, that's just, okay, we've identified one more way, it doesn't work, great. Let's go on to the next way and we will find a way. But the thing is, it's most important to not give up, not to lose hope, not to lose optimism, but to continue to look at the problems that we have from a number of different angles. And I think the ocean is one of those things, those places where you can do that, right? You, you know, when you jump into the ocean, for a minute, you don't know which end is up. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's where we need to be, where we need to be solving these problems from. Lose our orientation a little bit and forget what we know. Because once we start looking at things from a completely different perspective, we will find all of the solutions that we require. Thank you so much. <laughs>that happens on the planet and how we interact with nature. Um, and, and obviously the oceans is a huge part of where that's applicable. And there's a huge frustration that I think we're all feeling from the grassroots right up to the halls of the UN um, at the kind of pace of change that is happening. You know, we're all aware of how serious the problem is. We're all aware of what it is. We're aware of why it's happening. We're actually aware among the many things this, that the previous speaker was suggesting. There are so many solutions out there that are fantastic and that can really start moving us in a new direction. But all of those solutions right now still feel like an uphill struggle. And we would say that that is because the correct framework is not in place. Now, we would like to look to international law to help to provide that framework. And we focus specifically on the aspect of criminal law, which is very rarely brought into these conversations at all. But it should be, because in our globally dominant Western paradigm, what we use criminal law for is to draw the moral red lines. So criminal law ultimately is about protection. It's not about punishment. Of course, having the crime in place means that people that commit it will be punished. But why is it really there? It's there to stop the crime from happening. And so using criminal law has a particular potency when it comes to the protection of each other and, of course, by extension of our Earth. And the most serious level of criminal law is, of course, the international crimes. We're all familiar with the ones that are currently in place at the International Criminal Court. War crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and more recently, the crime of aggression. We believe that ecocide, or mass destruction of nature, should be sitting there alongside those crimes. And this is not just a good idea. 
This is a, an initiative that is growing, fast growing into a global movement, of which Stop Ecocide International, our advocacy organization, is at the heart. But it's also a conversation that three years ago, no governments were having. Now, more than 25 are having this conversation. So this is a very live, active initiative that is drawing more and more attention as we speak. And since we opened our pavilion, come and see us, P42 over in the blue zone, we, it's been non-stop conversations, many of those with state representatives. Key milestones this year, or in the last, actually last year and a half, the first and perhaps the biggest was the establishment of a legal definition of ecocide. And I'm going to read it out to you. It's very, very short, and it's super simple. And it came from a consensus drafting project of top lawyers from around the world. So it has huge weight and credibility in the political sphere, also the legal and academic sphere. And it has already become the de facto starting point for discussions. And it's this. Ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. So that language is familiar to those who are familiar with international treaties, but it is also very understandable. And it even fits on the back of a business card. And that, of course, is super useful if you're dealing with politicians, because they don't have time to read 20-page reports very often. And this definition has gained a huge amount of support. And it's, what it does is it creates a foundational piece that shores up the existing body of environmental law, which is already extensive across the world, but very badly enforced and very badly followed. But of course, if you're in breach of a regulation and you're threatening that severe level of harm, suddenly you're facing personal criminal responsibility for that. That affects you, it affects your company, it affects the future, the stock value of your corporation, and it affects effectively everything that you can then do as a result. So it has a huge power as a deterrent. And that is what we are encouraging people to support right across society, because politicians are always the last to the party. When we're all there having a good time, they're going to turn up and agree with us. So just a couple of little things that we'd like to say about how that is um, progressing already here. Very recently, we just had hot off the press news from Belgium that the Belgian government is proposing a bill to criminalize ecocide in Belgium and is also going to support the international law. So this, is, this ball is already rolling. <laughs> And my time is up, so I'm just going to finish by saying that um, there is also huge support now from the business community because they're seeing it as a framework, especially investors, they're seeing it as a framework to mitigate risk and to create a, a, a sort of set of parameters within which to get creative. And having come from entrepreneurship myself, there is nothing like a clear set of parameters for doing that. And the latest Climate Champions report from New York, the Pivot Point report, actually lists ecocide law as doing exactly that. So the potency is already there before the law's in place. And finally, the youth statement. And we were talking about the importance of the youth movement in all of this. The youth statement for COP27 has very clearly demanded for the, I think, fifth or sixth time now in the international forums, has demanded that government leaders move towards criminalizing ecocide. So this is a call that is now coming from everywhere. Join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jojo. I actually just did an explainer on ecocide. It's a great movement to follow, and it's crazy to see how big it's gotten over the past year itself. Uh, our next guest is Lisa Levin. She is a professor emeritus at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and a representative of the executive and HQ team at the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, also known as DOSI. Today, Lisa will specifically focus on deep sea ecosystems that support minerals of interest and their key features, the scientific gaps that need to be filled for management, and the environmental impacts of deep seabed mining of emphasized knowledge gaps, as well as key cons considerations for the industry. Lisa. Thank you. I'm hoping some slides will show up. There we go. Um, 
I'm a professor, so you get slides. Uh, and now I understand why I'm following Jojo, because I'm going to be talking about a form of ecocide, actually. Um, how do I advance these? Let's see. This way? Maybe. All right. So we are, I'm going to take you to the deep ocean. We're not going to be talking about whales and dolphins, but many of the other organisms down there. And I want to start with why we should care about the deep ocean. It's the largest realm on our planet. It cycles essential nutrients. It removes massive amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, absorbs heat, it detoxifies our oceans. It has great potential to provide solutions to some of our biggest problems in terms of food, energy, materials, medicine, uh, and new technologies. And really, truly, we cannot have a healthy planet without a healthy deep ocean. So let's talk about minerals in the deep ocean. There is now interest in mining minerals to, uh, to produce cobalt and other metals for electric car batteries, to fuel our electronics and wind turbines and so on. I would argue we probably don't need them from the deep ocean, but first let me tell you what the story is. People would like to mine these minerals from three different ecosystems, from polymetallic nodule provinces that you see depicted here. These potato-sized nodules have a lot of zinc, copper, cobalt, nickel, and other metals of interest. There's interest in mining them from massive sulfides at hydrothermal vents where there's a lot of gold, copper, and silver. And there's interest in mining them from uh, seamounts in the ocean from cobalt crusts where there's also a lot of copper, nickel, and other elements. There are now more than 30 international exploration contracts in international waters for mining these metals. Um, they're granted by the International Seabed Authority, a UN body created by the law of the sea to manage the minerals on the seafloor. And you can see the different areas of the eastern and western Pacific, the southern Indian Ocean, and the mid-Atlantic Ridge that are targeted for deep seabed mining. There are many, many impacts of mining. We don't know them all, but we know there will be loss of biodiversity. There will be massive removal of habitat and substrate. There will be the creation of large sediment plumes, changes to the chemistry of seawater, and a lot of noise and light pollution. And those impacts won't sit in the mining footprint because the ocean is so interconnected with uh, lots of connections between the surface waters and the seafloor and connections across the ocean through migrations of many uh, marine mammals and even turtles. Um, we know the impacts in one place will be transmitted across the ocean. We also know that animals in the deep sea live a really long time. They, the fish can be hundreds of years old, but the large invertebrates can be thousands of years old. And the experiments have shown us that in a quarter century, there's virtually no recovery from, uh, or very little recovery from disturbance in these nodule prov provinces. And I should mention that the minerals themselves, which are, provide critical substrate, grow, um, it takes a million years or more to form a polymetallic nodule or to form those crusts. We know from studies of bottom trawling that suspended sediment and destruction of the bottom uh, create a kind of disturbance that animals just can't recover from easily. There was a recent assessment of knowledge across the areas or habitats targeted for mining conducted by Diva Amman and a whole series of scientists. And only 1% of the scientific topics uh, assessed across the mineral exploration contract areas had sufficient information to enable evidence-based management of deep seabed mining. In other words, there's a lot we don't know. We have gaps in our taxonomy and the distributions of animals. We don't know their life histories, how long they live, how they reproduce. 
We know almost nothing about the midwater above the areas targeted for mining. Uh, we don't study inactive vents up to this point. We don't know much about the southern hemisphere or the protected areas uh, in, in the mining targets. We don't know very much about connectivity, the variations, uh, the spatial and temporal variations in these ecosystems, or even uh, the functions and services provided by most of the animals in these ecosystems. In order to manage uh, an activity like mining, we need to fill an amazing number of knowledge gaps. We need to understand what is serious harm to this environment, what are some of the indicators of ecosystem health and what are the threshold values for harmful effects on the environment? These are all actually technical terms that the international seabed uses, serious harm and harmful effects. We need to know the spatial extent of mining impacts, the impacts on ecosystem services. We need to know the risk of extinction for animals in the deep sea. We need to understand the temporal extent of recovery. Will communities ever recover from seabed mining? You know, not, probably not in a human lifetime. Uh, we need to understand cumulative impacts with climate change, uh, and as I've already mentioned, functions and services. So this is really my take home message to you, is there is currently insufficient scientific knowledge to enable evidence-based decision making in line with the International Seabed Authority's environmental obligations. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I uh, love a good PowerPoint. Um, clearly, we don't know a lot about the ocean. But by all means, let's go to Mars uh, and fly celebrities to space. Uh, our next speakers are from the Smithsonian Science Education Center. We have Dr. Carol O'Donnell and um, Holly Glover. They're both directors there. And today, they're going to be sharing an incredible program that the center runs called Smithsonian Science for Global Goals, with curriculums designed to educate and empower youth around the world between the ages of 8 and 17 to be agents of change in their communities. Now, the program is actually engaging schools across Africa, including here in Egypt. But students were not able to join. Um, but however, they brought them here virtually. So they will be showing a video. And they also have a collective call to action for y'all. So, Come on stage. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I want to get started with a comment that, Raquel, that you made. All right, she said, young people have brilliant solutions to address the climate change. We need to listen to them. And I'm going to end with that as well, because that is probably one of the most important statements we're going to hear today. So um, as Alejandro mentioned, we have a project called the Smithsonian Science for Global Goals Project, which is a collaboration between the Smithsonian Institution through the Smithsonian Science Education Center and the Inter-Academy Partnership. So this is 143 countries who have national academies of sciences, engineering, and medicine. We curate that science, and we bring it down into meaningful content in tools for youth to empower them to action. Um, so we believe deeply that this is a very transdisciplinary approach to learning. Our students are ages 8 to 17, and we work with their educators across the globe to bring together science education, social and emotional learning. We heard that earlier. This is not just about science. This is about social science as well. And civic engagement, something new for schools, right? Using knowledge for social good. We're bringing students' knowledge down to the local level so that they can engage in local investigations, make local decisions, and understand that their local actions make global change. In this graphic that you see in front of you, which is our theory of change, we call it the global goals action progression, the global gap, which, as you heard, there are a lot of gaps that exist right now in our understanding of sustainable development issues. We know that young people come to us with a lot of questions, and they are at the heart of learning. And unfortunately, traditional teaching doesn't do that. Traditional teaching means that the teacher has all of the knowledge. Their job is to impart it on these empty vessels that sit in their room so that they can regurgitate it on a test. And that is not our approach to learning. We believe that in order to develop, woo, all right. 
We've been working on this for 37 years. The Smithsonian believes deeply in experiential learning, and our job is to understand what are the questions that young people bring to us. What is their cultural context? What knowledge do they already have? What is their learning disposition? And to understand that before, before we begin to give them an opportunity to do three things. Discover the issue on a local level. Understand the issue by investigating it using their laboratory as their community. The data shouldn't be given to them from some unknown source. They should be given the opportunity to collect data, data that's meaningful, data that answers the questions they bring to the table. The second, to investigate that issue and then to engage in critical reasoning, um, reasoning from evidence. In other words, making choices based on that data. Then using that information, synthesizing it and sharing it with others in order to act use their knowledge for social good. And we're trying to develop their sustainability mindsets, open-mindedness and reflection, equity and justice. This idea that there's local and global connection and that we have to understand that students recognize that they can be part of this solution. We have eight guides to date that are all based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which you'll hear about probably from our next speaker, from issues around biodiversity loss, food security, um, this idea of infectious disease, mosquito-borne diseases being included, or COVID-19, and biotechnology and the ethics of it. We have nine more that are slated and funding for half of those already. Now, my colleague Holly is going to talk to you about impact. So to date, the Smithsonian Science for Global Goals project has reached 2.8 million students across 72 countries and 30,000 educators. Carol and I could stand up here and tell you about the amazing student-engineered solutions to local sustainability issues um, that students in Malawi and Ghana have engineered in their communities to reduce standing water to try to eradicate mosquito-borne diseases in their communities or to transform public education to try to reduce pollution. But instead, we're going to let the students of Egypt tell you about their projects themselves. Or are we? But gradually, Luxembourg has become more and more dense in population that it's about to burst at the seams, with fewer parks than needed for such a huge city, one of which is Al-Shalalat Park, a park with such a historical value having the ancient wall of Alexandria sadly left unnoticed. But let's let our mind loose for a second. What if we add set of parks evenly scattered across the city and reconfigure the spacings of the buildings around them? Big difference, isn't it? Let's take it a step further and add water surfaces, which would soften the temperature of the area. Much better, am I right? To conclude, by focusing the constructions more on the other ends of the city, evenly spacing the construction sites with green areas and water lakes, decreasing our carbon footprint, and have a better public utility system, which would affect the magnificence of the city and the comfort of its people. And that can lead to the reignition of the interest of foreigners, making Alexandria the first eco-friendly city in Egypt.
So, did you make an impact? Yes, we did. People started to turn off lights after leaving the room. Our parents started to consume less water and less plastic. Our friends started to throw trash in recyclable bins and using eco-friendly products. And the EU started to use renewable energy resources by solar panels. In this project, we were a great team. We became more confident and we gained a lot of knowledge, skills, and attitude. And we brainstormed a lot that we even made our own response analysis. We came from different backgrounds. We faced a lot of challenges. We sometimes felt we, we couldn't make it, but teamwork makes the dream work. Who wouldn't love a job like that? Working with young people across the globe to change the way that they're able to recognize that they can make a difference. Um, so our call to action, as I mentioned to you, we've developed eight of these courses that are implemented with young people around the globe, like our colleagues in Egypt. And now we're about to, because we've received funding from the Gordon and Benny Moore Foundation, to develop our ninth guide on oceans. And we need you people like Sylvia Earle and others in the room who have expertise in ocean science, history, art, and culture to bring it together in a transdisciplinary way to help young people understand the interconnectedness of the oceans and our climate. So please, if this is something that's of interest to you or you know somebody who's an expert in the field, we highlight you as research mentors we draw on your scientific knowledge and we share it with others from both a westernized and other ways of knowing indigenous views. So please do help us not only to develop this content, but to share it in your communities. So thank you so much. Carol, Holly, thank you so much for empowering youth and you heard the kids, teamwork makes the dream work. All right, our next guest is Yoko Watanabe. She is our global manager of UNDP's GES Small Grants Program, and they are actually celebrating their 30th anniversary, so congratulations. The Small Grants Program is one of the largest global funds dedicated to supporting innovative community actions that address global environment issues with civil societies and community-based organizations, including women, indigenous communities, and youth groups. Now, today, Yoko will share more about a community-based adaptation program specifically implemented in small island states. And the stage is yours. Thank you very much. It's such an inspiring day. And thank you very much for inviting, and particularly Joshua, for that, that voice from the ocean was so powerful. And I have to say, it reminded me of my time that I swam with that humpback whale in Tonga, where we were able to develop a community-based marine protected area in the country. So what do we do? Small Grants Program is a partnership program with GF a Global Environmental Facility and implemented by United Nations Development Program. And what we do is local climate action and other global environmental issues and addressing climate crisis and other global crisis that we face today. Local Community-based action is a key for success and sustainability. And it's really time to walk the talk. We've been hearing from the world leaders all this week. What we really need is time for action. And it's not too late, as Sylvia mentioned. And we really are here to support local work from the bottom up. So building capacity of local communities and empowering the local experience is what we do in Small Grants Program, and we've been celebrating our 30th anniversary, and we had an event last, um, to, last night. 
And this is basically to really bring the heart of what we do, the local community's innovation and solutions to the table and really take an action on the ground. So the small island development states, or we call it large ocean states, the climate resilience is linked to ocean health and resilience and economies and livelihood and culture and traditional practices are strongly connected to the ocean and marine environment. And recognizing this, we have recently started a new phase of our community-based adaptation program to increase the resilience of the communities, both socially as well as environmentally to the climate change, and build the blue economy and climate uh, sort of uh, react to the climate change to, um, and make sure that their community survives and thrive. And the small grants program have been here to 30 years supporting 128 countries, including um, small island states. And we have been working on biodiversity, conservation, climate change, mitigation and adaptation issues, land degradation, international waters, chemicals and waste like plastic that we saw in the screen as well. And SGP was sparked to the idea that the active participation of local communities in dealing with critical environmental issues hold the key in promoting effective stewardship of environment and achieving sustainable development goals, as my former speaker talked about. And besides the central role as an incubator of innovation, what we do best is to really bring the innovation, the traditional knowledge of the indigenous peoples, the women's group who have different um, aspiration and goals towards uh, their supporting their families and communities. We bring in persons with, with disability into the planning stage of disaster risk management and others. And SGP is a social inclusion platform. So 50% of our projects actually involve youth and I'm really happy to see many youth here as well. And we have more than 30% of our project is geared towards women's group. And 20% is focused on indigenous people's group. So we bring in that sort of inclusiveness to this initiative of addressing climate challenges and actions. And since 2009, the community-based adaptation program supported by the government of Australia, we have supported close to 200 projects in 41 countries and that includes 37 countries of the small island states, developing countries. And we, from the watershed management in Trinidad Tobago to protecting jellyfish in Palau and supporting local technology to desalinize the ocean water to drinkable, portable water, we've been innovating different local technology, local solutions, and bring that to the table to the policy makers so that that can be expanded to the policy level, as well as other programs at the national and global levels. So we're really excited to launch this fourth phase of our program, the third phase of our program, and expand this for the next few years, and really make a difference on the community-based actions on the ground. So rather than me talking, I think this is time to see it. Um, so I'd like to share a short video of the Small Grants Program Community-Based Pro Adaptation Initiative.
Thank you very much. Local action, global impact. Looking forward to partnering all of with, with you moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yoko. And um, we have our final speaker tonight. Tonight, wow, what? You know, it's been a long conference. It's been a long week. We've made it through. It's Friday. Uh, today, this morning, it's, uh, his name is Vincent Pierrebone, and he is the vice president of OceanX. Um, if you're not familiar with OceanX, uh, or you're not familiar with Vincent, he has an extensive history as a marine researcher in the fields of cellular and molecular physiology and neuroscience. And today, he's going to be sharing some recent work OceanX has led in the Red Sea, which we could literally see from right outside. And he's also going to give us a sneak peek uh, into a new film on the Red Sea. So, Vincent. Uh, excited to be here. And um, I want to thank, actually, Lisa for introducing our, our organization in some way. Um, this is the brainchild of Ray Dalio, a, a, an American philanthropist who later in life decided that the ocean needed help. And can, you know, using his resources, he decided to pinpoint and focus on a particular aspect that he thought was important. And that uh, aspect that he felt was important are basically two, uh, intensive science collection of data and communication and media to the world. So the centerpiece of the organization is our research vessel, uh, Ocean Explorer, that was just uh, commissioned and put into service two years ago. That follows a previous vessel we worked with since 2012, the Aleutia. And the Aleutia traveled the entire world doing scientific studies and producing media events and television programming associated with the ocean. Many of the programs that you're probably familiar with uh, we were involved in producing. Um, the vessel is extremely capable. It's a stunningly beautiful vessel. It's an aspirational science platform. It's the highest tech thing you could ever imagine. And we drive this vessel around the world and we leave it at the disposal of countries so that they can do research in their waters using uh, the latest, highest tech to, to collect the data in the deep ocean because it's a very deep water vessel. We can cover 98% of the ocean floor with our vessel, as well as shallow waters and in the air. So it's like a Swiss Army knife of, of a of a functional program. So I'm going to highlight a Red Sea program we did this year. We spent 18 weeks in the uh, Red Sea uh, in several countries, actually, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, other places. Uh, we, had, we, had never, we had been to the Red Sea in 2020 and did six weeks, but we did a very, very intensive scientific investigation and media production uh, in the Red Sea for the past 18 weeks. Um, let me see if I got the right button. Here we go. So our overall themes as an organization and what we do when we get there in the water is 24 hours a day science, seven days a week. We do mapping, intensive mapping. We do intensive biodiversity surveys, environmental characterization, what we call targeted discovery, which is kind of the cool, fun stuff, finding crazy animals, getting them on film, exciting, and celebrating the ocean. Uh, and then uh, inventories of megafauna, which are all, always a big hit. And we spend a lot of time in the air with drones and the helicopter on board, searching and cataloging and um, quantifying the number of megafauna that are in the, in the water column. And we do that with a variety of equipment and things I, I won't go through. But um, this was an example. This was created by uh, Carlos Duarte, who's really a world-class um, oceanographer. You're all familiar with him. He's the one who helped drive this um, this, this 15-week experiment that we did in the Red Sea. We basically went all the way from the bottom of the Red Sea to the Yemen coast and Farrasan Islands and drove all the way up to the Gulf of Aqaba and then finished in, in Jordan, uh, in completing, completely mapping the entire Jordanian waters and doing a number of dives. What it was was consists of every, every day the activities involved shallow water work, coral studying, mapping, uh, and then mid-water work with the vessel, mapping, ROV dives, submersible dives, uh, AUV dives, helicopters in the air the entire time, collecting massive amounts of data about the ecosystem to help the countries surrounding the Red Sea uh, the, um, to manage these ecosystems. This is just a tiny summary of an example of what, what happened during the, do during the trip. We don't, haven't obviously analyzed the uh, data completely. We have on deck around 60 papers uh, to be published. 17 have already come out from our 2020 uh, adventure. We did 129 days out at sea working, 150 hours of flight with helicopters and drones, and did the most extensive survey of megafauna in the entire Red Sea ever done. Uh, we did 415 ROV and submersible dives to every depth in the Red Sea, all the way to the brine pools at the bottom. Discovered an entirely new brine pool in the north. You'll see uh, come out in a publication. Collected 3,800 soil and water 
and coral samples from the deep and shallow water, all of which are being analyzed and sequenced as we speak. We brought 131 collaborative scientists on board. We brought um, students. We brought educators on board during the entire trip. And we mapped 62,000 square kilometers of the Red Sea, um, as much as Saudi Aramco had did, but not made available to the rest of the world uh, in the past 10 years. Um, we had key media outputs from it that are, you'll begin to see trickling out. I'll show a, a, a little snippet of one in a moment. We did live classrooms in Arabic and in English from the vessel. Uh, we did 10 short films and put it out on our 9 million uh, follower platform. It also went to all of China through the Paradise program and Jack Ma's program. We did local outreach by bringing students from Jordan and Saudi Arabia on the vessel. It's the, both uh, Saudi Arabia is not as sort of um, extent the children in the, the region are just not extensively aware that they have this amazing ocean right at their coast. So we spent a lot of time doing that and extensive uh, press pickups in relation to it. Um, so that was our trip. That's us on, this, on the coast of, of, of northern uh, Gulf of Aqaba, just south of the, of the border, where we discovered enormous squid in the water that are about eight to nine feet, swimming right out there in the front of where you are. And these, which are these amazing little guys, Rizzo's dolphins, which we filmed and, and quantified while we were in the ocean. So um, for my last 21 seconds, I will show a video, if you don't mind, if it hasn't run, a short bit. Oh my God. What we're doing in the Red Sea Deck Expedition is bold. It has not been done before. To me, it's the same as space exploration, but it's right at your doorstep. And right below is a completely unknown world. Green light, green deck. The Red Sea is 1,700 kilometers long. This is a massive, massive undertaking. When we built Ocean Explorer, we, we had these kind of missions in mind. And Ocean Explorer really excels at having large numbers of studies simultaneously, so we can have scuba diving happening while we're having an RV down at 6,000 meters, two submersibles down while we have a helicopter in the air. We are here to tell the world and to tell the next generations that the Red Sea has this biodiversity, the Red Sea has these problems. You need to have a baseline to understand what you have. We try to find out how to rehabilitate all those very sensitive ecosystems and keep it healthy for long time. We have to be here, we have to do this. When we started this project, a lot of us didn't understand the Red Sea very well. We thought of it as another large body of water, but it turns out that the Red Sea is actually a very unique environment. It's very warm all the way to the bottom, and that's where the Earth is headed with all of the changes that are happening, anthropogenic changes. So what we're looking at here is essentially the future state of a large part of the world. And oddly enough, animals have evolved to live in this place, and they've evolved to flourish. It gives hope to some degree that as the rest of the world heats up, flora and fauna of the ocean will be able to survive or will still flourish when temperatures are raised. There's been this very big change within the mindset of the leaders that really want to see a focus on the marine ecosystems, and this expedition is doing just that. That's one of the reasons why this is so timely. The culture of collaborating and working together is going to leave a legacy that is going to enable us to address many other challenges. It's a huge opportunity to lift the state of marine research and also conservation in the Red Sea. Understanding the world around us is something we need to have as an essential goal for us and for our children. You know, I'm learning. I'm learning from these organisms. They adapt, they fight. They fight for their life in the sea. There are lots of changes happening to them. There are lots of changes happening to us. Our research that we are doing now can be in the biology classes tomorrow in our school. They'll be studying the information that we collect on this trip for the next 10 or 15 years. We are not here to do this work. Who else? Thank you. So great science, great media. Join us, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Vincent. That uh, concludes all of our speakers. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. Again, just keep, keep the fight, keep, keep the spirit alive. Everyone's doing amazing work. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for, for the rest of the day and all the programming. Thank you.